off our uh, mid-morning session here with Joe Scherger. Uh, Joe's going to share with us some personal stories and experiences, as well as talk about some of the latest trends in the concept of disease reversal, something that I don't think any of us learned about in medical school because it was such a foreign concept. So, Joe, enlighten us. Thank you, thank you, Stan. And I uh, chose to save my slides for tomorrow and just engage the audience. I, I do a lot of speaking uh, in my community and I find that when I speak without slides, it's often better than when I speak with slides. Now you can just look at me instead of the screen. And all the names and books and things I'm gonna mention uh, are gonna be either on the slides tomorrow or they're on my website, leanandfitlife.com. So leanandfitlife.com. Uh, my book on Amazon is called Lean and Fit. A third edition is due to come out very soon. Uh, brought some copies with me if you want to see it. But um, just to personalize this for me, for 35 years after residency, I was a really good guidelines doctor. You know, I drank the Kool-Aid of good American primary care. Uh, I also got a master's in public health when I was a resident, uh, so I knew a bit about nutrition and healthy communities, uh, but I was you know, really following things along in the American medical cultural model. Uh, that was until five years ago at age 63. Uh, a peculiar thing happened to me. Uh, I'm a rabid books on t audible books person, I'll call it now. Um, why, and it wasn't always that way, I grew up in a little town in Northwest Ohio, 7,000 people, Delphus, Ohio. Delphus was founded by a German parish uh, in Iroquois country at the time, 1845. The Germans under Bismarck you know, went through one of their economic depressions and the Lutherans took all the jobs, the Catholics didn't have, couldn't survive. So entire Catholic parishes were coming to the New World. And, uh, and indeed, Father Otto Bredike down the St. Lawrence Seaway and through Toledo and went south, um, uh, found a place for his parish from the Rhineland to come and settle. And that was the beginning of Delphus, Ohio. My parents are distant relatives uh, uh, from that parish. And, uh, and so you might imagine the Catholic Church uh, is the biggest thing, and I went to parochial education. Uh, and in my Delphus St. John's Elementary and High School, uh, the uh, uh, history and all these other subjects were taught by either coaches or nuns. And, uh, and, and I went to a Catholic university, University of Dayton, where I whizzed through in my aptitude for math and science. And I go, come to the medical college admission test, and it was different in 1970 than it is now. And I took the medical college admission test, 99th percentile in science and quantitative analysis, 14% in general information. <laughs> and when I did my medical school interviews, they said, you know, you really are distorted. <laughs> and, uh, and that kind of stuck with me, but in medical school, who has time to learn anything but medicine? But fortunately, thanks to John Fry, one of the other early University of Miami, Lynn Carmichael uh, the persons, but one of my heroes that I, I mentor, um, is um, he convinced me to apply and I was lucky to become a Kellogg National Fellow. When you become a Kellogg National Fellow, this is the 1980s, you're supposed to learn stuff outside your field. And so one of the things I did, my focus was on what, what, what are the determinants of health in communities other than the medical care system, which was a rich area. The work we do comes in seventh as a determinant of health in a community. Uh, but I decided to fill in the gap. So I started listening to what it then was books on tape and cassettes, and I've never stopped. So I have a continuous book in my car I bring the book on airplanes. I have it on when I'm getting dressed in the morning. Uh, I'm a rabid books on tape person. So 19, uh, five years ago, um, 
books, you know, audible books, which I'm a member of now, they had their daily deal where if you got the book within 24 hours, it was less than $5. And the daily deal happened to be a book written by a physician cardiologist in Milwaukee called Wheat Belly. And I thought, Wheat Belly, I never heard of that. And I read a little bit about it. And I said, that looks interesting. Uh, so I downloaded it and uh, listened to it. And then I listened to it again and quickly ordered 15 copies. Um, William Davis is a modern, was a kind of a modern day Robert Atkins. Now I know I'm taking a risk here because to talk about somebody like Robert Atkins in a scientific community uh, is a potential disparagement. But I've actually written an article uh, about Robert Atkins called Profile and Courage, uh, which, I, which nobody would publish, by the way. Uh, so I published it in my book. Uh, and I want to just give you briefly the Atkins story, because most he's an incredibly misunderstood physician. Um, smart guy from Dayton, Ohio, interestingly enough. His parents owned the Pine Club restaurant right outside the University of Dayton, where we used to go at the end of the day to get steaks that didn't people, people didn't eat that were going to be thrown away. But, uh, um, and, but he's smart. He went to the University of Michigan for undergrad. Uh, got into a Cornell Medical School in New York, uh, completed that and did both internal medicine and cardiology in Columbia, opened up a cardiology practice on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in 1958. The only problem was he was morbidly obese. He, he looked in the mirror and he said, I have three chins. And five years into that, uh, he read his JAMA, like we all do, and the University of Wisconsin had done a study that was published called A Novel Approach to Weight Loss, a Very Low Carbohydrate Diet. And so he read the study and he was impressed. So he decided to go on the diet. He lost all of his excess weight, triple chin went away. So he started doing this work with his patients. And when you're on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, you got some wealthy and well-known patients and uh, Vogue magazine got word of this guy's diet because he was helping a lot of people lose weight. And so they wrote it up and it actually became known during the 60s as the Vogue diet. And uh, Johnny Carson had him on the Johnny Carson show to talk about this low carbohydrate diet. And, uh, and it wasn't until 71 that he wrote his first book. And uh, the rest of course with him is history. Now, he didn't invent this, and neither did the University of Wisconsin. If you, if you Google low-carbohydrate nutrition, uh, the first recorded writing was a guy named Banting in England who was an undertaker, and he noticed that the people, he, he was having to build bigger coffins because there was so much bread consumed in England. Uh, bread was more than 50% of their calories, and people were getting fat. So he had to have bigger coffins, but he decided to go off bread and go lower carbohydrate, and uh, and he and he and he lost all this weight. So he wrote a he wrote a pamphlet, which at its time was about as famous as Thomas Paine's Common Sense. You know, uh, writing a pamphlet was kind of a way to get the word out. He wrote a, a pamphlet called an essay on corpulence and about carbohydrates. Uh, in the twenties, Gaylord Hauser a nutritionist who wrote 19 books, the most popular one, Live Longer, Look Younger. Uh, he was in Hollywood, lover of Greta Garbo, and used low carbohydrate nutrition to keep the actresses looking healthy. Well, anyway, let me fast forward to William Davis, who was an interventional cardiologist in Milwaukee, originally from Cleveland, and uh, uh, he, had terrible health. He had type 2 diabetes. He had full-blown metabolic syndrome. He was obese. He decided to lose his weight, went low carbohydrate, spontaneous combustion happens as it does, and he reversed all of his health problems. And, and so he wrote this up in Wheat Belly and published in, in 2011. So I, uh, who was one of the biggest promoters of fiber one cereal and uh, could never walk past a chocolate chip cookie or a good looking muffin uh, without using it, 
uh, decided to do this myself because I was overweight. I didn't like my waistline either. And, uh, and my lipid numbers were not that great. And uh, so I decided to do this and magic started to happen. The first thing I noticed is that I was never hungry again during the day. There was no need for a snack at any time. No four o'clock rule that uh, carbs drive hunger. Carbs cause an unstable fluctuating blood sugar, repeated pulsations of insulin in the body. And, um, and I was no longer hungry. And not even thinking a notion about calories, just eating healthy fat and protein type foods. My fiber one cereal became raw nuts, almonds, walnuts, and I started adding ground flaxseed and chia seeds, some fresh berries, uh, plain yogurt, because every other yogurt is full of sugar. And, uh, and started, you know, I had my superstar breakfast that I had with my bowl, I describe it in my book. I was never hungry again the rest of the day. That's just all I ate. And indeed, 18 pounds just fell off of me. Um, when I was in college and as a young man, I had a 32 inch waist and uh, weighed about 155 to 160. And, uh, and then over my career, 34, 36 inch waist, just kind of happened, middle age spread, totally normal, no big deal. Not obese, just overweight. Uh, but I was even running marathons and I go into the running store and they kept saying, well, you're a heavy runner. You, you, you weigh this much, so you need these special running shoes as a heavy runner. And I didn't, never liked hearing that. Well, indeed, within four months, I had a 32 inch waist. Uh, my weight went right down to 160 where it has stayed and uh, the rest is history. That's been five years because I don't eat refined carbohydrates. I eat fruit in a normal amount, uh, but I eat what is kind of the health diet. And um, so changed my life. I, in the next year, took more weight off my patients than I'd done in 35 years before that by cutting the carbs. Now, carbs are the most profitable of all foods. We've been talking about the capitalist healthcare industry today. It's pale compared to big food. The food industry is very powerful, very profitable, and they promote the foods that make money. Carbs can be stored, you can put them in stuff in bags and boxes, they don't spoil. Uh, there's, you know, there's nothing to compare with the profits. Grains are a very profitable commodity and it's what America does. I mean, if a country's in trouble, we ship them grains, we ship them flour-based foods. And, uh, and so when you take on the carb industry, uh, you're taking on a big gorilla. And, um, and worse yet, um, sugar and, and the literature now on sugar, if you really want to dive into it, is really rich. But the labor costs of producing sugar are now such that there is no more sugar made in the United States. It all comes offshore. The last sugar uh, plantation and refinery in Hawaii has been shut down. Can't do it due to labor costs. However, the American farmer has an alternative solution. It tastes just the same. It's called high fructose corn syrup. And of course, as a result of the green revolution where 80% of our American fields are either wheat or corn or soy soybeans, and in the world, rice that makes up the foundation of much of our diet and pretty much all the animal and fish feed that is fed to these creatures, um, it's a massive industry. And um, there was a mother in Iowa who wrote a letter in her local newspaper against high fructose corn syrup. Now what's, what's different? High fructose corn syrup is a foreign substance to our body. It's not an, a food that we evolved to eat. Sucrose, at least our body knows what to do with it. We can even metabolize sucrose, a disaccharide of fructose and, and uh, glucose in the bloodstream. Doesn't even require the work of the liver. 
However, high fructose corn syrup is different. So it's sent to the liver. And to make a long story short, the liver figure out how to metabolize it, but it causes inflammation. It's a, it causes fatty liver. It causes fat to deposit in the liver. Now we all learned the Krebs cycle. Uh, you know, it's interesting. When you train in functional medicine, which I've done, you actually bring the Krebs cycle back to life. You relearn things called gluconeogenesis and lipogenesis and how they happen. Well, pretty much all the body fat that we all have on ourselves beyond normal, that lipogenesis all is driven by carbohydrates. You know, the body is actually, you know, these, these new nutritionists, deep science, but as they described it, they've kind of simplified with kind of an Occam's razor approach to <clears throat> what the real science is. And because we're taught all this confusing stuff, especially about diabetes. You know, you remember the liver slides of the diabetes and all the different metabolic pathways that make up diabetes? Well, it's not that way. And David Ludwig from Harvard articulates it very well with his study. It's all about glucose and insulin. There's nothing else you need to know about diabetes except glucose and insulin. Now we were taught insulin drives uh, sugar into cells. That's only one of its major roles. It stimulates lipogenesis. It stimulates the conversion of all the sugar you're not gonna burn into fat. The only way that eating fat becomes fat is you have to eat it with a bunch of sugar. And, uh, and healthy fats by themselves, it's why, as Mark Hyman so well describes in his book, Eat Fat, Get Thin, is uh, eating fat without sugar doesn't make you fat, it's the sugar that makes you fat. We are like hybrid cars. We have two energy sources. We either burn carbs or we're gonna burn fat. But the way we work as, as, a, as, as bodies is that carbs are the first fuel. They're always the first fuel because actually your body doesn't want to have a lot of carbs on board. It causes high blood sugar, atrophy of the brain, insulin overload, a lot of negative stuff. So your body is actually working to get rid of the carbs. It actually wants to use fat as a fuel source. <coughs> it's a very steady, predictable fuel source. It causes a stable blood sugar. We don't need to eat carbs. Sarah Hallberg in Indiana, who runs the intensive dietary clinic to reverse diabetes and reverse obesity, the title of her TED Talk, seen by over a million people, is How to Reverse Diabetes by Not Following the Guidelines. And she points out that it's not hard to reverse type 2 diabetes. I can take any type 2 diabetic and make them a non-diabetic on no drugs, normal, not even pre-diabetic, within two weeks to three months. And all I ask them to do is stop eating foods we don't need. There are no essential carbohydrates. The Inuit in the far north that live on caribou have a zero carbohydrate diet. They get their vitamin C from bone marrow, they eat the organ foods, they give the lean meat to the dogs, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the Samburu and the Maasai in Africa live well without deficiencies on a zero carbohydrate diet. Now, I'm not here to promote a zero carbohydrate diet, only to point out that we have essential fatty acids. Without getting our essential fatty acids, we don't live. We have essential amino acids. Without getting our essential amino acids, we don't live. There are no essential carbohydrates. And the human diet, We've been on Earth, Homo sapiens goes back to our current knowledge 300,000 years. Might be longer, uh, but we're about, we've been here about 300,000 years. Until 10,000 years ago, 2% of our life on Earth 
we ate nothing but the food of nature. Our life was get up in the morning, hunt, gather, play, because we know the hunter-gatherers had plenty of time to play, feast, go to bed, wake up, hunt, gather, play, sleep. We ate one meal a day, and we ate the food of nature. When you're eating root vegetables and nuts and even some fruit and, uh, and animals, because we know we couldn't have survived if we weren't omnivores, um, your nutrition was mostly fat, moderate amounts of protein, and maybe 10%, 10 to 15% carbohydrate. That is the human diet. That's the diet we've eaten for 98% of our existence. And almost all of our chronic diseases, and this has been laid out by Daniel Lieberman at Harvard in his book, The Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health, and Disease, argues that we're now in a state of disevolution as a species because of our industrial diets. And so we're, we, we basically live in a hunter-gatherer body because our genetics have not really changed in only 10,000 years. We live in a hunter-gathering body living in a modern industrial, first agrarian and then industrial culture that causes mismatched diseases diseases that are a mismatch between our body, scientifically, evolutionary, well understood, and our, our common culture. Three meals a day is cultural. There's absolutely no health basis to three meals a day. And some people even want to throw in some extra snacks. Um, type 2 diabetes is, does not exist. You know, Joslin, when he was a resident, at Mass General in the 1890s uh, was the first person to find type 2 diabetes and write it up in the literature as a case report. The disease hadn't even been described before then. Uh, it, was a, it was a big oddity. But what has happened to the amount of carbohydrates in the diet since then in America and in terms of our food culture has made it the most expensive of all illnesses. It is an unnecessary illness. It's an illness that exists only because of our carb culture. Now, this, is, this kind of work has kind of evolved just this decade. What's incredibly exciting, what gets me excited, is while the roots of this knowledge was before, the revolution has been started this decade. Building off William Davis in his Wheat Belly books, was a neurologist with a master's in nutrition named David Perlmutter. He became famous in 2014 with his book, Brain Brain, where he took the data that basically the deterioration of the brain, neurodegenerative diseases were being driven by blood sugar and inflammation, but driven by blood sugar primarily. And um, beautiful, elegant studies, New England Journal of Medicine graphs, your rate of brain atrophy is directly related to your blood sugar. A normal blood sugar is fasting below 90, never gets above 120. When you have that kind of blood sugar, the size of your brain, it, all things considered equal, is going to be normal. For every 10 points your fasting blood sugar goes up, you will have brain atrophy as a senior in a direct relationship. If you're a type 2 diabetic, you have four times the risk of Alzheimer's disease at any age as a senior compared to normal. And pre-diabetes, it's double the risk. You've probably heard that Alzheimer's is being called type 3 diabetes. It's, it's glucose toxicity to the brain. We're not supposed to have all this glucose. As a matter of fact, the, um, the formation of insulin resistance, the basis of type 2 diabetes, is a defense mechanism on the body. The body basically says we can't take any more sugar in the cells. We've got to stop this insulin. And so we basically stop the insulin from working. We become insulin resistant as a response. It's just like the amblin plaques in the brain 
and the tau proteins, the amylin plaques are outside the cell, the tau proteins are inside the cell, that's scar tissue from the insult of the high blood sugar and the inflammation. The neurologists, in their passion to find the magic bullet for Alzheimer's, they've developed drugs that will dissolve amylin plaques and will dissolve tau proteins. The drug companies invested millions in this work. What happens? The patients get worse. Their dementia doesn't get better, it gets worse. It's like treating a sepsis by only dissolving the scars. It's, it's, it's to go to the root cause, root basis of the problem. The, um, finally, some academic physicians started getting into this. People, and tomorrow in my talk, I'm only going to use people that are at medical schools. Because when I comment it, at medical meetings, when I bring up Davis and Perlmutter and Mark Hyman, they consider them popular authors. They are not scientifically based and solid. Isn't fair at all. Every one of their book chapters has a long list of references, all from the peer-reviewed literature. So they're drawing from literature. They're not the, the flakes out there. There's plenty of flakes in the whole wellness world that kind of give it a bad name. But it's now being, it's now moved into universities. Um, Indiana, Duke, and Toronto have academically based clinics, intensive dietary management clinics for the reversal of obesity and type 2 diabetes. They all use healthy fat, adequate protein, very low carbohydrate diets with intermittent fasting. You know, the other thing, the kind of thing we've learned to reappreciate today is one of the healthiest things you can do is to not eat. The state of fasting causes mental clarity. It's so good for the brain that it even stops ep epilepsy and prevents seizures from happening. It was the treatment of epilepsy before Dilantin. Um, but not eating, uh, putting what Jason Fung at Toronto does with his intensive dietary management is a type 2 diabetic will come in with their high blood sugar and say, we've got to reset everything. So I'm going to put you on a 3-day, 7-day, 10-day, sometimes even a 21-day fast. We'll cover your micronutrients, your vitamins and minerals. You're going to stay very well hydrated. We'll monitor it. But no more macronutrients for this period of time. What is, how long can we go without eating? Six months. Six months. Anybody else want to do a taker? Well, in, in our medical literature, the cases referenced in Jason Fung's book, uh, The, the uh, Obesity Code, uh, in our literature, there was a 27-year-old man, if I, the numbers I may not have precise, he was 27, and he was in a medically monitored fast. He weighed 452 pounds, I believe, and he fasted for 382 days, more than a year. Did not lose a pound of muscle. He kept working out, but dropped all the excess body fat. You know, we're, uh, the way our bodies work, we, we burn the carbs first, about 2,000 calories is all we can store in our liver and in our muscle, and then we start burning fat. And the concentration camp phenomenon doesn't happen until we've burned off all our fat, then we start catabolizing and burning off our protein. But we don't burn off our muscle and protein until we've burned off all our fat. The body's actually not all that complicated. By the way, I'm a marathon runner. I've run 40 marathons and 15 ultra marathons, five of them 50 miles. I do that on very low carbohydrate nutrition, just like other marathoners who follow. Jeff Volick at Ohio State, who's an RD, PhD, has got the deepest science around low carbohydrate performance. Novak Djokovic, the number one male tennis player in the world, back again, uh, credits his being able to be number one in the world by not eating carbohydrates. No carb loading, 
no Gatorade. You know, if you're living on carbs to keep your energy, uh, you fall out because you can only store a limited amount. And when that runs out, your muscles cramp and you get dizzy and you don't feel good. Your performance goes down. If you're a carb burner, or if you're a fat burner, even Djokovic with 5% body fat has 80,000 calories of energy, even in his 5% body fat. I'm 12% uh, body fat. The, um, uh, you have loads amount of energy. Djokovic in the fifth set, has, he feels the same as he felt in the first set because his blood sugar has not really changed the entire time. Uh, recently, the number one and number two finishers of the Tour de France did not eat carbs. They uh, only healthy fat and protein. You know, not zero carbs, but very modest amount of carbs only from whole fruit uh, would be the only carbs that would be part of the diet. Uh, that's our biology, that's our science. The, the uh, common GI problems. You know, the other big problem of brains, the biggest mistake the human race ever made, according to James Diamond, brains come from grasses. We're not supposed to eat grasses. We're not designed to eat grasses, but we figured out how to eat grasses by turning it into flour, uh, wheat, and oats, and all that stuff, corn, they're all grasses. But um, the other big problem, besides the huge amount of carbohydrates, pectin that we get out of that is that it has proteins that are inflammatory to our bodies. And if you're a grain eater, you have a different microbiome than I do, or people who are living off just the foods of nature and not eating grasses. We all have learned about the microbiome as this new organ. And we talk about it in the, in the literature like it's <clears throat> like the liver. It's like a separate organ. The microbiome, which we develop after conception because, and we're usually born sterile, it first begins by going through the birth canal and from hopefully breastfeeding helps develop your healthy microbiome. If you're a grain eater, like almost all Americans are and around the world, you have a different microbiome and it's not a healthy microbiome. Doesn't matter about your genetics, your culture, there are variables that influence it, but if you have a grain-eating microbiome, you will have dysbiosis. Remember that, there'll soon be an ICD-10 code for it because it's a common diagnosis. Dysbiosis, an unhealthy gut microbiome. It causes SIBO, SIBO, pay attention to that, you'll hear more about it small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. What happens to a grain-fed microbiome is it starts migrating north, and it migrates into the permeable small intestines, and it releases proteins into our bloodstream that get through the permeable small intestines. And our body reacts to those proteins as if they're foreign bodies. Now it is currently postulated that we're postulated that all of our autoimmune disease is triggered by antibodies against those proteins from small intestinal overgrowth. We've had an explosion since the 1970s in autoimmune disease. Frequency has been going up steadily. It's felt to be nutritionally related due to our dysbiosis and in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. H. pylori in the stomach where did it come from? It didn't come from the community. H. pylori is one of the good guys. It's a good bacteria in the colon. But it migrates all the way to the stomach if you're a grain eater. And it causes, as we know, not only peptic ulcers but other acid peptic problems. You want to have 80% of all of your patients with GERD, and irritable bowel become well, you take them off of inflammatory food. Grains are the big gorilla. You make them grain free, soon the problem is gone. You've got to wean them off their PPI drugs. 
We know the PPI drugs are unhealthy if taken chronically, but they're taken chronically because people can't be okay without them. They depend on it. And so they're dependent on a drug that's gonna give them fractured, <coughs> dementia, vi vitamin deficiencies, all of these other things caused by these drugs because of our grain-based diet. And again, this has all been spelled out. There are two GI clinics. At Johns Hopkins, there's an interesting gastroenterologist who also has a degree in nutrition. And his name is Gerard Mullen. And he runs a GI clinic at Johns Hopkins on reversing GI problems. He's written it up in his book, The Gut Balance Revolution, where he takes people and puts them on only the foods of nature and, uh, and gets them off of all their GI drugs. He restores the acid stomach, which we need for our health. We need an acid chamber in our stomach. Uh, we don't get acid reflux if we only eat the food of nature and go off grain-based diet. The next most in common inflammatory food and the second mistake we made as a human race 8,000 years ago is to milk cows. Cow milk is not human milk and it has an inflammatory protein in it, casein A, which starts to affect us as babies. It's the cause of all those crazy baby rashes and infant colic. Now this literature, a lot of it came out of Scandinavia, is suppressed in the United States by big food. The Dairy Council, the Corn Refiners Association, the Wheat Board, these other things are incredibly powerful. And quite frankly, they have bought organizations such as the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, all of these others heavily influenced by millions of dollars a year from big food that suppress indeed what we learn. But Gerard Mullen does this at Hopkins. Robin Chutkin was, at, was trained at Georgetown. She's a gastroenterologist she's on the faculty at Georgetown for many years, but she's opened in Washington, D.C. a women's health GI clinic to make women healthier. Robin Chutkin, C-H-U-T-K-A-N, R-O-B-Y-N-N-E. -N -N -E. She became famous with her book, Gut Bliss. Her second book, The Microbiome Solution, is probably the best and most scientific, but she gets rid of women's bloating and common GI problems by purifying their diet, getting them off of the inflammatory food. Now, Sarah Hallberg, who reverses obesity and diabetes in Indianapolis, and Eric Westman does it at Duke, both very well-known people. Sarah's a young mother, and uh, doesn't have, she, uh, Larry and I know her because we've met her at a conference. She said, I don't have time. She was at the Innovators Workshop, what, two years ago, I think. But she said, I don't have time to write books. I got kids at home. But so she, she's done an 18-minute TED Talk, and... Uh, and various podcasts, but a writer up at University of Toronto, Jason Fung, um, has spelled it out in much, much greater detail and has articulated the intermittent fasting that's critical. Um, he says, we've been way too focused on what we eat and not nearly focused enough on how often and when we eat, and he brings that element into it. So his book, The Obedi Obesity Code, is why insulin is the fundamental hormone of obesity causing lipogenesis. The other thing, lins the other thing obesity uh, insulin does in the body when we pulse it out is that it slams the door and puts a lock on it to burning any fat. When you stress your body, you go out and have the donuts and the bagel and the sugar water with vitamin C that we call orange juice, and uh, you start doing that stuff, you basically go, oh my God, pour out some insulin, protect the body from this sugar, lock the door, no fat burning. I mean, I watch people in the gym and the fitness center and they're working so hard to try to burn off some fat and then they go get you know, a high sugar bar or a Gatorade or something like that. They're wasting their time. 
exercise will not do one iota for weight loss unless you turn off the carbs because you won't burn fat. You may become a little less fat because you'll burn more carbs instead of the lipogenesis that comes uh, from the body, so maybe you'll put down less fat. You're not gonna burn any fat until you let your body burn fat by getting the carbs down. So reversing those. Now, one of the biggest things that's happened, the Dale Bredesen story I'm gonna finish with, I'll talk about it more tomorrow. Dale Bredesen is a science neurologist. He wasn't a clinician. He was in the lab, UCLA appointment, working in the lab to find the magic bullet for Alzheimer's. He was part of the scientific team trying to dissolve amyloid plaques. And, um, and it all failed. His wife, fortuitously, is a family doc trained in functional medicine. And she basically told her husband, the only way you're gonna fix Alzheimer's disease is to fix the lifestyle. And she said, well, I don't do that. Okay, I'm gonna study. So being the scientist he is, he started the trials and he took a woman with early Alzheimer's disease and did the full court press of functional medicine. You know, the low carbohydrate diet, totally anti-inflammatory diet, various supplements, made sure there were no heavy metals and the whole nine yards. They describe Alzheimer's as a leaking roof of 36 different holes. You gotta plug all of them to stop the leakage. And lo and behold, this patient got better. She actually reversed her cognitive decline. It's written, a case report is written up in the journal Aging in 2014. He continued the work and in 2016, he published his first 11 patients who either reversed their cognitive decline or substantially improved the cognitive decline. He's now he's refining the protocol to what's called the Bredesen Protocol, or RECODE, reversing cognitive decline, to more than 200 patients. It's all spelled out in his book, The End of Alzheimer's, and, the, and he's now training people all over the world to reverse Alzheimer's disease through intensive lifestyle management. The body wants to heal. As long as we have telomeres, as long as we have stem cells hanging out, and believe it or not, in your 80s, you can have neurogenesis. Scientifically shown neurogenesis in your 80s by stopping the insult and healing the brain. That is really kind of the final testament to the power of lifestyle. You know, I know during my career, and I'll end with this, you can all remember getting the latest guidelines. I mean, every time they came out, I devoured them. And you'd have like eight pages describing all the various drugs. And at the end, they would say lifestyle modification, like for hypertension, you know, cut down on the salt or something like that, you know, really soft stuff. Lifestyle has made us a sick society. Our health span has dropped dramatically. Even our lifespan, lifespan is starting to drop, but our health, we've created this massive medical industrial complex. We spend more on type two diabetes drugs than all of Major League Baseball, the NBA, and the National Football League combined on type two diabetes drugs. The number one drug that, that we give by an expense is Lantus and Levomir, insulin that makes the disease worse. I mean, it's like giving alcohol to alcoholics. Sure, we drive the blood sugar down, but the patient gains five pounds in the belly, making them more insulin resistant and more diabetes. So we spend all, we're doing stupid palliative care for chronic disease. And we're teaching our doctors and our residents to do that. That's, we got to start an intensive lifestyle medicine revolution. The Institute for Functional Medicine is doing this. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is doing this. Family docs are going to these things in large numbers. It's incredibly exciting to see. Thank you. Jeffrey 
Bland, this is all goes back about eight years ago, and he's not even a doctor, he's a PhD up in the Seattle area, um, wrote the book, The Disease Delusion. But he basically, functional medicine differs from integrated and alternative medicine, although there's overlap, but functional medicine basically says, let's go to the core, let's go to the, to the cause of the disease. And if we can deal with that, we'll restore health. So it's all about going to the root cause of the disease to restore health. And they've learned, there's like six big elements of it, but they learned that you begin in the gut by restoring gut health through a healthy, low-carb, anti-inflammatory diet. And then the other aspects of like stress management and better sleep and, you know, get the toxins out of your environment. The functional medicine review of the patient is basically restore health by fixing the lifestyle. Go to the root.